uh, you know, the, the chorus. Any questions at all? Is uh, the voice is coming through, right? There's a little echo? Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, so uh, uh, just uh, a reminder to you that your papers are due a week from today. Uh, and you should bring a, a, a printed copy with you to, to class. Uh, I want to let you know at this stage that I will not be doing all the grading. I'll be doing some of it. So there's a graduate student uh, in South Asian Studies who's going to be assisting me with the grading. Um, but uh, you'll know if the paper has been graded by me uh, because I'll put my initials for the papers that I've graded. Uh, and if there's anyone here who's uh, particular about having me grade your paper, all you have to do is just let me know when you turn it in at that point. Otherwise, it's going to be pretty much random which papers are going to be graded by me and which will be graded by the, uh, by the assistant working with me. Okay? Um, and, and finally, uh, I did send out an email with the, sh with the principal Sri Lankan reading, uh, so all of you should have received it. Uh, and if everything goes according to schedule, uh, I should be wrapping up with this in the early part of the lecture on Thursday. What I'm going to be speaking about today is uh, uh, the question of development uh, and uh, well-being uh, in India. Uh, you know, uh, questions having to do with economy, uh, with agriculture, with poverty, and all of that. Uh, and I expect to uh, have to do a little bit of this on Thursday as well, but. I think uh, if all goes according to schedule, the, the last two-thirds uh, of the class on Thursday will be devoted to Sri Lanka, and then we'll continue with that uh, the following Tuesday. Now, uh, the point at which I terminated my discussion is I had spoken to you at some length, and I will not be revisiting those questions uh, at this juncture, but I'd spoken to you at some length about politics in India, uh, domestic politics, the question of uh, politics uh, and the state, society and state. Uh, and we had also looked very briefly at such things as India's relations with neighboring countries uh, and problems in some neighboring countries, including Pakistan, when I'd spoken to you at some length about uh, the war of 1971, which led uh, to uh, the liberation of East Pakistan and its transformation into the state of Bangladesh. So that, that's, that was the component that we had done. Um, and what I want to do today is I want to really move to the subject uh, uh, of development. So that's really the, the key operative word that we're going to be looking at uh, for the lecture for today. Um, but before I get into that, if you look at this list of issues, um, which I've sort of draw, drew up in random order, uh, uh, and I could easily, of course, add another 25, 50, 100 to these. Uh, these are some of the issues that that one takes up and one begins to look at the question of how India has fared. Because if you look at the two principal readings, right, so you had chapters from both of these books, you had uh, more extensive readings from this book called An Uncertain India, uh, An Uncertain Glory India and Its Contradictions. Uh, the, the two authors here are both professional economists. Amartya Sen is a, a world-renowned uh, economist. He won the Nobel Prize for, lit for economics. And, and, and this book, uh, Churning the Earth, the Making of Global India, from which you had one chapter. Uh, both of these authors, Asim Srivastava and Ashish Kothari, are, are, are um, uh, people who have worked on ecological issues. I mean, I, I would say that Ashish Kothari has been working on ecological issues in India for uh, close to four or five decades. Um, and so you get, you, you get complementary views, but I, for those of you who have done the reading, uh, I think you would agree with me that it's kind of overwhelming, not intellectually or theoretically. Uh, it's overwhelming simply with respect to the kind of data that they share with you. You know, what is, what is the nature of poverty in India? Uh, what is the daily calorie intake uh, in India? So, you know, some of the things that are mentioned over here are drawn uh, from that. Um, and uh, this is a very good time to mention one of the strategies that I have adopted uh, in this class thus far, and will continue to work with that strategy, namely that sometimes I will not really be addressing the readings at all, particularly because I think if you look at these two readings, um, uh, I think you would probably agree with me that you don't really need to have uh, 
much of an interpretive framework outside the reading itself. That what uh, uh, Asim Srivastava tells you when he tells you that, look, if you look at the daily calorie intake, notwithstanding all the claims that have been made by uh, the Indian state, you find that the daily calorie intake actually has decreased uh, a little bit, for example, uh, in most of India. Uh, if you look at the brief discussion that he has, of course there's a discussion of this in the rest of the book which you're not reading, uh, but if you look at the discussion in the chapter that you did get on poverty, uh, the few pages that he devotes to that, uh, he gives you various kinds of figures about what is the extent of poverty in India today and how does it compare uh, with the uh, uh, claims advanced by uh, the Indian state. So rather than looking at each of these things in detail, uh, which it seems to me is not a productive way to do it because, as I said, it's fairly clear what they're saying and you don't really need an interpretive mechanism for that. What I want to do is I want to put all of this into a much broader framework, uh, a different kind of intellectual and theoretical framework. But before we do that, I think it's useful to just look very briefly uh, at some of these things just that you get a little idea of what is the real significance. So if you take something, for example, uh, like fair price shops, okay, over there, num four, number four on the right-hand column. So you know in India they have what is called a public distribution system, uh, or PDS, which uh, uh, Ashish Kothari talks about, uh, which is also mentioned in the other book. Um, and what, and in colloquial English, these are called ration shops. So, you know, I, when I was growing up uh, in Delhi uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, early 1970s, uh, even a middle class family such as ours, and if I had to give you a kind of a, a uh, socioeconomic profile of the family that I come from, I mean, I would say that we were uh, what we might call middle middle. Uh, so the, you know there's a lower middle and then there's a middle middle and then there's obviously an upper middle. So we were probably what you would describe as a middle middle class strata of Indian society. Uh, the neighborhood that I grew up in West Delhi. So this is not simply anecdotal because the same kind of story could come up in all the readings and what, it, what, it's, what I'm doing here is I'm giving you actually a little sketch of a neighborhood and how life plays out in that neighborhood for someone coming from the strata of society that I come from, which is middle middle class. So for example, uh, what kind of school did I go to? I went to a school that was English medium uh, and it had a very English name, Springdales. Uh, there, were, there were no springs there, there was no water there, I can tell you. The only water, you didn't want to be anywhere close to it because it was stinking. Uh, you know, it's, it's like the bodies of water that you find uh, in many parts of India today, which are, which are highly contaminated and, and polluted. But it was, it was uh, more or less what you might describe as kind of on the outskirts at that point in time. In the late 1960s, early 1970s, it was really on the outskirts of New Delhi. It was considered to be at a considerable distance from all the government offices. Uh, today it would be viewed very much as part of the metropolis because I want you to keep in mind the population just to give you an idea of how how the population has changed. That the last census before the partition of India was in 1941 and the 1941 census gave a population of Delhi of approximately 400,000. And today the population is approximately 21 million. All right, so you can see why that part of Delhi, which would have been really on the outskirts, is today now very much part of what emerged as uh, the metropolis. All right, now um, even a family such as ours, where my father was a civil servant, working for the Indian government, for the Indian Foreign Service, the diplomatic service, even someone like my father, who, who would have been viewed at that time as quite privileged, right? A family like ours had to use the ration shops. So what is a ration shop? That you got a ration card. And in fact, until very recently, 
the Russian card was the principal source of identity of a person. Right? So, the, so the Russian card that would be issued, this was issued in my father's name, would list members of the family. And then depending on how many members of the family they were, in this case, there were four members of the family. What do you do? You go to one of these fair price shops. And what is a fair price shop? This is a shop that has been established by the state where every person who carries a Russian card gets a certain amount of sugar and salt and wheat and kerosene oil. These were the four major items. Okay? Sometimes you might get a bar of soap. You know, in those days, you actually did get a few bars of soap. So obviously, if it was a family of 10, then the proportion of wheat that you would get would, would be much larger than if it was a family of four, depending on how many people were listed on the Russian shop. And what that meant was that this, this, what you were getting from the, from the Russian shop or the fair price shop was something that was being given to you at a highly subsidized rate. So, the, so in other words, what the state does is it procures, that's called the procurement price. If you ever see that in any of the literature today, so that's a rate at which the state buys, let's say, 10 tons of wheat from, from a farmer. And there's a procurement rate for wheat, for sugar, for cotton, whatever the case might be, for rapeseed oil, right? Semolina, there's a procurement price. And so the fair price shop was a, was a shop where you would go with a ration card and then you would get a certain amount of all of these goods. Now one of the things that's happened is that this system has largely collapsed. Right? And we're going to try to understand the implications of why it has collapsed and why these Russian shops barely exist. And when they do exist, they don't function as they ought to be functioned. Which is not to say, by the way, that back in the 1960s and 1970s, they were necessarily functioning very well. And lots of people who purchased things from these fair price shops who often complained that the quality of the wheat that they got was not very good. The quality of the rice that they got was not very good. Right? And of course, you could go to a you could go to a, a uh, you could go to a, a a small grocery store or a small small supermarket. There were hardly any supermarkets back in those days, in the 1960s and 70s in India. But you go go, go to a private vendor, in other words, and you could buy the same thing, which would be at a much higher rate. All right. So the idea was that the state has a certain role to play in a developing society. Right? That's, that's essentially how you need to understand something like a fair, fair price shop. Now, if you, go, if you go through this list of items, what we find is um, uh, that, the, that the figures that, that are given by Amartya Sen and Jean Drez and given in the other book by Sri Vastav and Kothari are, are figures that give us some insight, whether it has to do with daily calorie intake or whether it has to do with rates of literacy, whether it has to do with the poverty level, they give us some insight into the question of how India has been doing, right? How well it has fared since 1947. Because think of it, why should all of this be of interest to the historian? One of the reasons why it's of interest to the historian is because to some people, the question that comes to their mind is that, well, you know, we, we, we often argue that it was as a consequence of colonialism that India was set back, right? So therefore, at least the conservative historian is going to, is going to opt for a line of questioning where the person will say, well, if it is colonialism that set India back, how has India done in the 70 years since the end of colonialism. Right? And of course, the question, if it's cast in those terms, seems to be a fairly straightforward, innocent question. And then you might say to yourself that, well, you know, some of the, that some of the roots of these issues cannot be addressed simply by mechanisms of the state. So they're very complicated, critical questions which have to do with what is the role of a state, particularly in a developing society. But just to give us some idea what kind of figures we're really talking about, so taking only the figures from this book, Churning the Earth, rather than from the other book, um, they say that among the scheduled castes, um, 
so this is, you know, I've mentioned this to you before. You remember going back to weeks one and two, scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. These are people who are listed actually in what is called a schedule to the constitution. So these are people who belong to groups that you might describe as historically disempowered. Groups that have been historically discriminated against for a long period of time or groups that have not been integrated into Indian society. So the scheduled caste would be here, would, would, would be the Dalits uh, and others. Uh, and so the poverty rate among the scheduled caste, according to, according to this book, uh, is a minimum 66% among the scheduled tribes, 81%. And then they take one Indian state just one Indian state, which is state of Madhya Pradesh, which is in central India. And if you remember, if you did the reading, you might not recall this particular detail, but just what, what they did, it, so the, this state at the time that they did their study, uh, so let's say roughly about 10 years ago when they were collecting the data, this one state had a population of 70 million. And then they take a country in, the, uh, in, in Africa, such as Congo, which had approximately the same population, and they find that the rate of poverty in Madhya Pradesh is 69.4%, and it's 73% in the Congo. Now, the, the, of course, the reason why this comparison is being made is because there are a large number of people who are accustomed to thinking of Africa as a place that is, quote, backward, right? And then, of course, what these figures reveal is that, well, you have an Indian state such as Madhya Pradesh where the rate of poverty is comparable to the rate of poverty in the Congo. I can tell you that the Prime Minister of India would not be very happy to have India compared with the Congo. Not at all, right? Uh, in fact, what he calls the vibrant state of Gujarat, of which he was a Prime Minister for a very long period of time, uh, that in this vibrant state of Gujarat, According to the figures given by these scholars, the number of children with stunted growth, that is that they're suffering from malnutrition in the state of Gujarat, which is supposed to be one of the most prosperous states in India. In 1992-3, the percentage of children with stunted growth was 44%. In 2005, six, 13 years after what is called the Gujarat model of development, right? So Mr. Modi and his friends and supporters have all spoken about the Gujarat model of development. Uh, they're friends of mine, we call it the Gujarat model of hate. That's what they've exported, not the Gujarat model of development. They've exported the Gujarat model of hate to the rest of India, spread that poison. But regardless of that, right, what, what were the percentage of children with stunted growth in 2005-06 after 15 years of vibrant development in Gujarat, 42%. Right? And I can, I can say with absolute certainty that all these figures are understated. Because to the extent that you have to rely upon government statistics, you can be quite certain that the percentage of children who are actually suffering from malnutrition uh, is higher than the 42% mentioned in 2005-06, right? Um, and page 86, they say, industrial vibrant Gujarat has a hunger index far worse than Nepal, Kenya, Pakistan, and Zimbabwe, end quote. Page 86, right? All right, so we can continue in this vein endlessly, ad infinitum. We can continue to look at all of these statistics, I mean, the most interesting ones and the ones, about, uh, ones surrounding which there is an enormous, enormous and still unresolved literature, not just in India, but in countries like Pakistan and many other countries, uh, these are statistics surrounding the whole issue of poverty. Because, of course, to make a proper assessment of all of this, we would first have to have an understanding of what we mean by poverty and how we define poverty Right? What is the poverty line? So, you know, they have what is called the BPL. BPL means below poverty line. And then they have what's called APL, which is above the poverty line. Uh, and when the Indian government tells you that, hey, now today the poverty level in India is only 30%, well, one of the things that, of course, you can do is you can shift the line. Right? You can shift the line. So if you look again at the statistics given in churning the earth, uh, on page, one, page 82, uh, it says that even if you revised the figures, so the World Bank used to have a figure which was $1 a day. I know it sounds absurd, 
But, but that was a World Bank figure. Uh, the, if, if, you, if you were living on less than one dollar a day, you were considered to be extremely poor. Okay, uh, in, in they finally revised the figure upwards to one dollar and forty-five cents, and at that rate, with that figure, the number of poor in India went up to five hundred and ninety million. All right, five hundred ninety million. That would be that would be over half the population of India at that time. This was about ten years ago. Um, and according to independent studies that have been done, one of the organizations, if you're doing work in India, by the way, I would recommend that you, you take a look at it. It's called the NSS National Sample Survey. So national, you know, India, India has had a large number of bodies having to do with statistics, which are recognized world over. Indian work in statistics is, is quite recognized. Uh, and the NSS, which is a national sample survey, is one of these uh, organizations that has done uh, what has until quite recently been considered extremely reliable work. I say until quite recently because the present government has attempted to gut this organization and has compromised its quality. Uh, but according to the NSS and according to independent scholarly studies, based on a number of different indices, 77% of India in the year 2007 lived on less than 20 rupees a day. Okay, the exchange rate today, today, is 70 rupees to a dollar. In 2007, the exchange rate was approximately, as I recall, about 40, 42 rupees a dollar. So at, at the, according to the exchange rate of that time, that would have been about 50 cents a day. 77% of the population. And I would say that, that whatever the official figure might be in India about poverty, I think it's very clear that somewhere between 60 to 75% of the country is living at the poverty level or below the poverty level. All right. But as I said, we can continue to fudge these numbers. We can move around them, move them around in various ways. There's a whole politics of statistics here. Um, and I don't want to, as I said, continue in this vein because we could go on forever and we could take all of these indices. I want to now try to put this into a different framework. You had a question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I, was, I read a little bit about the 2014 campaign with Modi. Yeah. And uh, many people voted for him because he, he did improve the state, but it seems like there actually wasn't much improvement. Yes. But what is it that he claims and is there anything that he actually did improve? Oh, well, you know, look, uh, I mean, it would really take very long to get into the question of what is the credibility of the claims, whether there's any relationship to, to what he claimed, and, you know, what you, can, what you can transparently see for yourself or you can verify. Um, I think the more fundamental question, and that's what I really want to address, is I want to address what we mean by development. Because it was, what is it that he was putting forward? What he was putting forward was the idea of vikas. Vikas is growth, development, right? So what was this Gujarat model of development? So let's move to a different set of questions. When independence came to India in 1947, and literally days before his assassination, two days before his assassination, Gandhi wrote a document. It's sometimes now referred to as his last will and testament because shortly after he wrote it, he, he was shot dead. And in that document, he states very clearly that, well, India has gained political freedom, but there are a multitude of freedoms. There is cultural freedom, social freedom, economic freedom, right? And that the country will now have to be attentive to these freedoms because clearly, in the fight up to in the fight leading to independence the idea of political liberation from colonial rule was the motive force of indian nationalism right for obvious reasons and there was a and there was a supposition that once this freedom had been delivered then other freedoms would start to fall into place and here again, I have to say that Gandhi is sui generis among all the leaders of that time, because unlike anyone else who was taking the view that, you know, we'll worry about the freedom of women. We'll worry about economic freedom. 
All of these questions, once we have achieved political liberation, and Gandhi, right from day one, insisted that, no, you cannot actually disentangle political freedom for, from all of these other freedoms. Because a country that oppresses its women, a country that oppresses its lower castes, will quite continue to do that unless we start tackling these problems and not wait until political freedom has arrived on the horizon. Right? So that's what the document was on the multitude of freedoms. Now, when independence comes and Nehru is placed at the realm, helm of power, the question was, well, how do you deliver for the Indian masses? Remember what the literacy rate in India is, 1941 census. Okay, I'm talking about the 1941 census. I mean, you're talking about a literacy rate in India at that time of 19%, one nine. And there's a significant difference between literacy rates for men and women, which is, by the way, true again in Pakistan. Bangladesh, that problem is being ameliorated. I've, if you read the book by, by Dresden Sen, you would notice that the figures for Bangladesh now are dramatically different than they, what they used to be for various kinds of reasons. Right? But, if you look at, but if you look at South Asia as a whole, particularly Pakistan, and you look at Nepal, India, you find that the literacy rates for women and men are actually quite different. They tend to be much higher for men, uh, and then they tend to be much higher for men in urban areas and in urban areas in certain states. There are certain districts of Rajasthan in western India where female literacy is about 5%. I'm talking about today. Certain districts. And then there are certain districts in the state of Kerala in South India where the female literacy rate is 100%. Right? So that's always a hazard that I've already you know, advised you about, cautioned you about, that when we speak of India, you know, we always have to keep in mind these enormous differences from one part of the country to another. And life expectancy in India before partition was 30 years old. Right? So now the question, the question for for people like Nehru and the Indian government was what kind of model of, of development are we going to have? And, and the first thing that they did was, and, and, and again, this is too long a history because I don't have time to get into the intellectual history of, uh, 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 you know, of Indian planning uh, and, and what is it that inspired people like Nehru, but you, you can s simply take it as a fact here in this case that, that somebody like Jawaharlal Nehru uh, accepted the Soviet Union model because in the Soviet Union they had they had what were called these five-year plans. So in India they had a planning commission and this planning commission came up with these five-year plans. And you know what a five-year plan does? It, what it does is it sets quotas. Right? So they say, you see, you, so when you have a five-year plan in 1951, then you say, okay, we're going to set a target that sugar production should go up from 500 tons to 5,000 tons. Coal production should go up from you know, 100,000 tons to 200,000 tons, whatever the case may be. You set yourself a goal, right? That's what these five-year plans were. I mean, I'm, I'm giving you the gist of it. There were obviously a great many other things too. The five-year plans also included, for example, a whole section on uh, having to do with contraception uh, because, of course, one of the fundamental concerns was, you know, well, we might have to bring down the growth, the birth rate in India, right? So family planning. So planning commission also included uh, also had under its mandate, although there was a different ministry there, which had, which was a ministry having to do with health and general welfare, but but the planning commission also had to think about such things as family planning, all right. But its fundamental model was taken from the Soviet Union. The idea was to have a grand plan for the development uh, of the nation, uh, and then you had a planning commission which was staffed by obviously experts, experts. Right? So this, this, this was one of the ideas of the, of, uh, one of the ideas of the machinery of modernity. That is that there are experts and that one needs to go to these experts to understand how you're going to lift your people out of poverty, right? And bring them the benefits of modernity. Now the question is, what is development? Right? And, I have, and the first thing that needs to be understood that development is a post-World War to discourse. I can't emphasize that enough. It really is. And someone here might say, well, well, how does one understand the Industrial Revolution? That was 200 years before, the, before World War II. Well, you know, didn't that have to do with development? But, right? Well, 
if you if you if you take this idea in the most colloquial sense of the term, the most colloquial sense of the term, because you have to remember that the word development exists in several registers. One of the reasons it's very difficult to mount a critique of the idea of development in general is because if you state your opposition, then you look like someone who's come from the caves. You're a troglodyte, you're a caveman, right? Because after all, why would anyone be opposed to development? You know, if I have children, for example, one of the ways in which I talk to my friends about my children over the years is you talk about the development of your children, you know? That, you know, if, and you can see that. Of course, you see how a child grows and develops, develops his or her mental faculties, physical faculties, right? There are signs of physical growth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we all obviously crave for the development of our own children, right? We don't want them to be stunted in any sense of the term, whether it's physical growth or mental growth. So, so development, in, in the ordinary sense of that word in the English language, has always carried a charge which people view as something that is positive. Right? What we are speaking of here is an ideology. Right? And we need to understand the nature of that ideology. There was always social change. See, for example, you go back to the 18th century, you go back to the 19th century, no society is ever fully stagnant. I mean, that was one of the, by the way, the favorite representations of British, uh, that the British had of, of India was, and this phrase is used constantly in the literature, unchanging India. Unchanging India. You know, the village had always been what it had been for 3,000 years. That if you arrived there in 1900, the likelihood was that the village would have been pretty much the same thing a thousand years ago. Because the European political model of India was that frankly nothing ever really happened there except at the very top. What happens at the very top? One despot is replaced by another. One Saddam Hussein is replaced by another Saddam Hussein, so to speak. Right? And then of course the British come as despots too, except that they're, be they're benevolent despots. They're not malignant despots. That's the difference, right? So this was, this was the theory of political despotism. And that on the base, nothing changes, right? This is, it's, a, it's like this. This is where the despot sits, the oriental despot. And this is the base here. Nothing ever really changes at the base. Peasants keep on doing what they do. They plow their land. The potter works with, potter, with clay. Right? The barber shaves the people in the village. They have a set of relations. And yes, of course, there are intermediary classes of zamindars, landlords, and this and that. But the political structure fundamentally never really changes. However, I'm suggesting to you that it is inconceivable that we can think of a society which did not have social change. Right? Relations get transformed. If they didn't get transformed, it would be impossible to explain why lower caste communities in India sometimes ruled entire states, which they did. And even a social system such as caste, which is supposed to be completely inflexible, never demonstrated anything like the qualities that were ascribed to it. There was always things, some kind of ferment going on. Social relations, economic relations getting transformed in various ways. Now the difference between social change, now nobody really speaks of social change today. I mean if you do IDS, International Development Studies, right? When did this word development really come into place and what does it really mean? And I'm saying to you that this is a word that comes into, comes into operation in the aftermath of World War II, in the aftermath of World War II, the US was the hegemonic power, by far. Much of Western Europe had been decimated. The Japanese Empire had disappeared. Unconditional surrender. And then, of course, you had large chunks of the world which were colonized. 
right? And even th those countries that had been the great powers, Britain is a very good example, large parts of Britain had been reduced to rubble. Germany had been destroyed. All of these countries needed to be, quote, developed. There were different mechanisms for doing so. For the countries that had lost the war, but which were going to be allies of the United States, you know what the US did, of course, they came up with something called the Marshall Plan, which pumped in billions of dollars into countries such as Britain and Germany. That's what the Marshall Plan did, right? And, 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 and we're not getting here into the geopolitical scenario here because there were obvious reasons, you know, the whole threat of communism, you need to have allies, which is one reason why, of course, the US was extremely hospitable to the former Nazis. Having tried 20 or 30 of them, then there were tens of thousands of them who were not simply forgiven, but who all became part of the American machinery of governance. All highly documented, you know. Right? But, but those are larger geopolitical considerations, right? The key thing here is that there was this idea of development. Now, let's understand it philosophically. You see, in the 19th century, okay, let me go back to the 19th century and it, so that you understand what is at stake here. Because I certainly am a ferocious critic of this whole idea of development. And I don't care how you whitewash it. You call it development with a human face, alternative development, you know, all these anodyne terms that have been used to try to make development more respectable, you know, and make it into a subject where you can get a major and a minor and all of that, right? Which is what has been done at the institution and completely sanitized it. What is development? Let's go back to the 19th century. You read Joseph Conrad, Heart of Darkness. So one of the, fam one of the most famous phrases in that novel is that the European thought that you could actually decide what the hierarchy of races was by simply looking at the nose of a person. If a person was snub-nosed, that meant you were on a lower scale of being. And by the way, there, is, there are entire fields that developed, such as craniometry, anthropometry. There's a man called Risley. Okay? He is the census commissioner of India. He is the principal anthropologist of the colonial state in India. And he comes, with, comes up with something called the nasal index. You know, remember I just talked about the hunger index? The nasal index. So you could evaluate where people stood on the scale of civilization by measuring the distance between the belly button and the nose. This, this was all taken very seriously. It was, this was serious. And you know, you had these anthropologists and others walking around with rulers. Every time they saw a Polynesian or a Bengali or a Tamilian or a Pashto, they would take out the ruler and start measuring and measure the size of the skull the distance between the belly button and the nose. See, what is that? It's a scale. The sharper your nose, the greater the civilization, the more elevated the civilization you came from. All right. Now, there were other scales. In the early 19th century, the scale that was used, which is still used today, was that we're going to place civilizations on a scale according to how they treat their women. So if you burn your women, which what the British claimed they did in India, there's this practice called sati, widow immolation. Now there's a very complicated history because it's not like sati took place all over India and that there were tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of women. Now, actually, the reason why we know so much about Sati is because the British produced all of these massive reports, parliamentary papers, dozens and hundreds of pages with statistics showing that in the province of Bengal, with a population of, let's say, 30 million, in the year 1800, you had 725 Satis. Then we have to understand why these Satis took place. So Sati, by the way, widow emulation means that when a woman of a certain caste community lost her husband, then she would sit in the funeral pyre with him, with his dead body, and burn herself to death. 
right? But this is, again, as I said, it's not practiced all over India. In fact, there is a, there's an argument made by one of the leading scholars of India who has argued that there's a sharp rise in the incidence of sati with the coming of colonial rule. We have to understand that. You know. But that's all well outside the purview of what we need to do. You, what I'm trying to simply convey to you is this, that the scale was, well, we understand how a country ranks according to how it treats its women. After all, what was the justification for 2001 invasion of Afghanistan? It was not simply that, ah, you know, our twin towers were taken down and these, you know, damn Taliban are holed up there, we're going to smoke them out, to use Bush's term, from these caves or wherever they are. Right? It was also that, hey, this country mistreats its women. It doesn't allow them to go to school. Right? It burns them, it puts them behind the veil, etc., etc. So this was, this was the classic model, as Gayatri Spivak, a leading theorist, would argue. This was brown women being saved from brown men by white men. That's what this narrative was about, and that's the narrative of 2001. It's a narrative of today, whenever the U.S. wants to go into one of these countries. That these men simply don't know how to look after their women. We're going to look out, because we are the guardian angels. Right? That was a scale. Never mind, so you could argue that, oh, they don't educate their women in India, 1800. Well, they didn't educate their women in England either, by the way, in 1800. I can tell you that with absolute confidence. All right? And you know, you should read the, the diaries written where working class girls are raped night after night in the English industrial towns. That's all part of the record of industrial civilization. So what is developing? Now the development index is different. So, you know, there is a UN releases a development report, UNDP, United Nations Development Program. And this development program provides you a ranking, just as they were doing 100 years ago, which was at that informal ranking. Now it's a formal ranking, which are the most developed countries. And you go all the way from 100 to 193, right? And then you see where a country is on that. And what are, what are the criteria? Literacy, for example. Right? Literacy rate. If it has a 99% literacy rate, if 100% of the population or close to 100% of the population has access to safe drinking water, to electricity, how many hospital beds for every 100,000 people? What is a maternal mortality rate? What is an infant mortality rate? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are 50, 50, 100 different criteria, but there are three or four major criteria. Literacy is one of those criteria, okay? Now, next step in the argument is think about it. See, you're, this, let's take it, you can take it horizontally, you can take it vertically, it doesn't matter, because we're just trying to understand the nature of the argument. So this is the line of development, okay? You're, you're, you are from Sudan or Congo, because let's say, let's take two countries that are viewed as being at the bottom of the development index okay and then you have countries such as so here we'll take countries which nobody wants to hear about them because they're all socialist as they're called by the administration here you know countries such as Iceland or Holland right which have some kind of social welfare system some welfare net these are the countries that are that always rate at the top okay generally right and New Zealand yeah so it'll be Holland, Finland, Iceland, Denmark. You, you, you get the picture. And then, you know, and then the US over here, let's say, okay. But let's, for the sake of convenience, just round it all up. So Western Europe, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, the settler colonies over here, okay. Now, what does development seek to do? What it seeks to do is it says, you need to keep on crawling. You know, it's like a child crawls. You keep on crawling, 
And then eventually, after you've crawled for a year, you begin to walk. And generally, when you begin to walk, you know, you, you're holding on when it's a little child. And then you begin to walk with more confidence. And then hopefully, unless you're like me, and you're not interested in running at all, you'll start running at some point, you know, right? Jogging, and then maybe running, and then maybe you'll become a super fast athlete, you know, the, the chosen few, all right? But you, you, what is it? You keep on moving along, okay? Because what is the intent? The intent is you have to arrive here, where these countries are, right? right? That's, that's the model that we're really talking about. If, now put this in temporal terms, okay? Think of past, present, and future. For a second, just think of that. And now think what's happening. One problem with the model is that the people who are sitting here, they're not just gonna continue to sit, they're moving along too. And they're not moving backwards. Oh, yeah, the U.S., I think, is. But, but most countries, what they're doing is they're moving here. They're going to continue to move. They're going to say, oh, greater equality for our people, better air, you know, get rid of fossil fuels or whatever it is. Right? They're moving. And so, of course, you could say that, ah, the first thing this model of development does is it condemns these people here, it just condemns to continue to play a catch-up game where you may or may not catch up, right? That's one way to look at it. But now let's look at it, and, and that would be, by the way, a completely legitimate way to look at it, in my view. I want to look at it in more philosophic terms now. The philosophic terms is that, you see, the European or the American here, 50 years ago, they were here. Or 100 years ago, they were here. Right? Now, what are the implications of that? If you're looking at it from the point of view of temporality, what I'm suggesting to you is this, that the Europe's, Europe's past is India's present. Europe's past is India's present. Now, we get, when we put it in this temporal framework, we see what the implications are. Because the implications are that people like me, coming out of India, or if you're coming out of Sudan, or Congo, or Kenya, or Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, whatever the case, you can never actually play out your own history. You have, your destiny is to play out someone else's history. You have to basically live out someone else's life, not your own, according to this model of what really development means. Because fundamentally, my present is their past, and my future is their present. That's what's really happening. And then we have to ask ourselves another set of questions. So this is what I mean here. Why should development be the scale for judging human civilization? Okay, what are the assumptions? It's very interesting, by the way, if you look at all the states in recent decades. Now, I'm not talking about the development of Germany, France, Britain, the colonial powers, which was all based on dispossession of others, and the United States, you know? I mean, you know, you can always make the argument that the U.S. never needed any colonies anyhow, because it had enough here. It, the frontier kept on shifting, right? The westward expansion, what is ex westward expansion about? It's like going into Africa, except you didn't have to go to Africa. You could just eliminate all the people here, which they did. That is what westward expansion meant, the elimination of Native Americans and appropriation of lands, absorption of territories, right? Until you become this giant country called the United States, spanning two oceans, right? It's very interesting that the countries that have, quote, become the models 
for development are all countries with authoritarian political systems. What was the test in the, you know, they used to talk about before the, most of you would have been born of the Asian tigers they were called in the 1980s. South Korea, Singapore, and all of these countries had authoritarian political systems. Right? I think that, that actually development and authoritarianism have always gone hand in hand. And, and if you look at Indian politics, I want to suggest to you that that has been a central force in shaping the thinking of the Indian middle class. One of the things that the, the Indian class really deplores is the messiness of Indian democracy. Right? I mean, privately, most of the educated in India will always tell you, why should the poor be allowed to vote? They don't deserve the vote. They don't know who to vote for as though they knew who to vote for when they bothered to go, the elites, which most of the time they don't bother to go and vote, according to the statistics that have been furnished of who votes in India, you know. But there has been this yearning for authoritarianism. And that is one reason, by the way, why Narendra Modi is so well liked and why he came into power with such an overwhelming majority. Because for a very long period of time, the Indian middle class has been distressed by what I'm calling the absolute chaos and messiness that democratic systems usually have. They want a strong iron man, right? And that is why there's also been a considerable amount of discussion about India moving towards a presidential system rather than a parliamentary system, you know? I mean, the country where Trump is more widely admired than any other place outside Israel is India. And that's partly the reason, because it has to do with this yearning for this kind of strong authoritarian leader who they feel is going to put the country on the track for becoming developed. Somebody had a question. Yeah. I was just going to ask if you would think that theory applies to like the several risings of like stronger alt-right authoritarian governments in different countries like, or stronger um, governments. So yeah. Like that uh, it, it may, but it will take very long to parse all of these cases, right? Because there are a huge number of countries where we're seeing exactly the same thing. Poland, Hungary, Turkey. Of course, the Soviet Union's been there, the United States. Huge number of countries where you have this kind of trend towards authoritarianism. Yes? I think an easy case to apply it to is the Philippines. Philippines, yes. Really easy, like national, want strong leader. Yeah. Like well, we know what he did with all the people that were considered to be, quote, drug pushers. I mean, whether it was verified or not, right? You, you know. Uh, how many, 25, 30,000 people just killed like that? But yes, Philippines would be a good illustration because it's, because if you're looking at the parameters that we are looking at, it's much closer to India than some of the other countries over here, okay? So, so now, so what, I'm, what I've done is I'm giving you a saying that, okay, we begin with this whole idea that we need development, what is development, we have a planning commission, there are certain objectives of state policy, but then we're saying, well, we need to actually rigorously think through what is the idea of development, because obviously there's a huge literature, and this literature that you're reading contributes to that, which is looking at what you might call uneven development. Why is it that if, if the country has been committed to development, why this development has been so uneven? Why is it that the ranks of the rich have actually increased in India disproportionately, disproportionately. Yeah, one of the things that the, the Churning the Earth talks about, but there are a thousand other such readings, is the enormous growth of dollar millionaires and billionaires in a country such as India. India has the third largest number of dollar billionaires in the world today, right? And yet you have 77% of the population, all right? Let's be generous to the state. Let's say it's 60% of the population living on $1 or $1.25 a day, right? So we have to try to understand how we can square these two different facts together, all right? And of course, there are questions such as, how does one, what is the objective of development? Is the objective actually to lift people out of poverty? We're not even, by the way, here discussing, because that would require a very extensive Okay, discussion of what we actually understand by poverty. Not how we measure poverty, 
and how these measures can change and how you can shift the line, but what we really understand by poverty to begin with. You know? Could you be super rich and be poor, for example, which I think it's possible, right? And what would that really mean? Because then we would have to say that, well, we would have to understand all the different registers associated with the word poverty. But that's a different kind of an argument, right? What is the objective of development? Is it the emergence of a middle class? Some people would say that that has been the fundamental development in India today. You know, if I, if I, if I told you, if I spoke to you anecdotally, I would say that, look, when I've been in Delhi for the last 50 years, the big change that I've noticed is that you don't see that many people with rags now, right? You, you, you don't see that many beggars who have virtually nothing to wear. You still see them, not that many. I could give you some anecdotal evidence of that kind. And I could say that, hey, consumption levels have grown enormously. You know, I remember 1960s, 1970s, power cuts of 12 hours a day, 18 hours a day, 24 hours a day, having to wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning to go to a DMS milk booth, DMS De Delhi milk scheme because milk was in very short supply. And do you know that India is the largest producer of milk in the world today? Largest, more than the United States, you know, right? And so you could look at that and you could say, well, that shows development. Now, to understand this in a different context, I wanna talk about the middle class in India. And I wanna understand, try to help you understand what are some of the problems in thinking about something called the middle class? And rather than posing it as a question, because we don't have that much time, I'm just going to lay it out for you very briefly a historical comparison with the development of the middle class in the United States, United Kingdom, and Western Europe. This middle class started to emerge in these countries in the 19th century. In Britain, it was a little bit earlier because the Industrial Revolution came earlier to Britain, although you really begin to see the development of a middle class closer to about 1800, 1820. In Britain, in Germany, it's a little bit later. In the United States, it's yet later for obvious reasons. I mean, you have a civil war here in 1861. You have plant a plantation economy in the South. And you still have a huge number of people coming in from Europe, right? Immigration. And of course, if you're looking, for example, at the 1850s, uh, you, you, know, you know where most of the people came from in the 1850s. One single country, Ireland, right? The huge potato famine. Right? And that obviously is not the middle class here. So the middle class is going to develop a little bit later. But we're looking at the 19th century as a whole. Now, to cut a long story short, the middle class in these countries was never defined. Unlike South Asia today, I would argue. And I, here I do mean South Asia. I think this is common to India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. It was never defined historically in these countries by levels of consumption. Okay? The middle class meant a class that understood that there are certain social goods we have in common. Let me explain to you with an anecdote, which you'll understand instantly. Where I live here, in the LA area, in, in the Sherman Oaks and Sino area, and this will be true no matter where you are in LA County, or Ventura County, or wherever, go and look at your parents' property tax bill. You know you get a property tax bill, divided into two installments, usually. If you look at it, it gives you a breakdown. How much of the property taxes are going to the local school? <coughs> and how much are going to the community college? There, and then there are taxes going to other things. But it tells you how much is going to the school and how much is going to the community college. Now, they don't ask you 
Do you have children? They don't. You pay a certain percentage which will go whether you have to the school district whether you have children or not. And if you have children and you send your children as they do in the richer areas, they don't send them to the local school, they send them to private schools. You know, my, my daughter used to, went through the lottery to Pacific Palisades school. Because in the Pacific Palisades area, a lot of the families don't send their kids to the local schools. They send them to private schools. All right. Now, why are you paying that money, you could say, when you don't have children? Why should you have to pay it? Right? Why should you have to pay it? Why should you have to pay for community college? If your children aren't going to community college. The reason you're doing it is because there is a tacit understanding that these are certain goods in common. That this is for the welfare of all. That in the welfare of all is your welfare. To use a Marxian phrase here. That's the assumption. And the middle class in these countries was a class of people who subscribed to this ideal. It did not simply mean a class of people who were consuming. Why did the US end up, and why did Australia, why did Britain and Germany, why did they end up having such a fabulous public library system? LA County still has a fabulous public library system if you used it. It does. And your taxes go to support these things, whether you use it or not. Because this was the understanding of what a middle class does. That it subscribes to some notion of goods in common, as I'm calling them. Now, this pact, I think is beginning to collapse, by the way, in the West. Long story, we won't get into that. Over coffee, we can discuss that. Yeah? But it was the pact that created and held together the fabric of these societies. In India, and here the remarks apply to across the board, to South Asia once again. They really do, in every respect of the term. Okay? The first problem is the elasticity of this concept. Because, you know, if I read the professional economists, political scientists, sociologists, I have seen figures anywhere from 150 million to 450 million people who belong to the middle class in India. Why? You know, if it said 150 to 170 million, okay. That, I, I can understand that. Right? Or if it said 420 to 440 million. No, 150 to 450 million. Because, of course, it's very difficult to understand what it means. And, you know, th this concept of is completely relative because, th because those who belong to the middle middle class in India would be really at the poverty line or below in the United States. I mean, in India, there was no question. There was a time when if you had a car... I mean, in 1990, the automobile, personal rate of possessions of automobile was minuscule, minuscule. I mean, even now, it's very small. I mean, when you go to Delhi and you think the car is, the city is flooded with cars. But two Indian cities, Bombay and Delhi, together account for 50% of all automobiles in India. Seriously. I mean, the minute you go into the countryside, it becomes quite rare, you know. So what we're saying is that, I'm not even taking into comparison whether, except for the very rich who would be considered well off by American standards too. I'm not even taking into consideration the fact that the middle class in India there has really got only private possessions through the degree to which relatively poor people in the US have them. I'm saying that within India itself, it's very hard to really define what a middle class is. So then if we're seeking a definition, I have a definition. 
And that definition is it's a consuming class. This is a class that is solely dedicated to consumption. And that's how they measure how well they're doing in comparison to everyone else. This middle class is not committed to any of the things that the middle class was committed to in the making of the United States, Britain, France, and so on. Public library system, a schooling system that actually works. No one coming from my class background in a country like India or Pakistan, I would say, would actually send their children to state-run schools. These are usually private schools. They're called public schools, by the way, in that part of the world, the old English usage. Right? They all go to English medium schools. The state-run schools where the language of instruction is Hindi or Urdu, these are for the daughters and sons of the barbers and the housekeeper and the maid and the driver and the washerman or washerwoman, the vegetable seller, maybe the plumber, because plumbers don't make what they make over here. You know, the minute you enter a house, hundred dollars, you know, and the clock starts ticking. No, that's not how it works with these professions in India. You know, right? that the, those schools are for them, the, and that system has completely collapsed. So, what is happening here? What is happening here? are two simultaneous things. So you know, there's a phrase that churning the earth they use, withdrawal of the state. That in many fundamental respects, the state in India has simply withdrawn. That is that it has left people to their own devices. This is, this is the, the most obnoxious use of, if I may put it this way, the kind of the laissez-faire theory in a strange kind of way, you know? The invisible hand will manage things. People will find ways to fend for themselves. So collapse of transportation systems, collapse of healthcare systems, collapse of water supplies, right? And that's why Asim Srivastava, because you might think to yourself, why does he have a three-page discussion of bottled water and how much water costs it? That's the reason why. Because these are the essentials of life. And what's happened? The state has basically withdrawn from all of these spheres of life. Now, the other process, which is a complementary process, it's happening at the same time, is the middle class has opted out of the state completely. And of course, the upper class, all the elites. What does that mean when I say they have opted out of the state? That, for example, in India, in North India, in Delhi, the major provider of telephone service was a telephone, state-run telephone company called MTNL, Mahanagar Telephone Limited, okay, Nigam Te Limited, MTNL. And then you had, you had obviously for regular mail delivery, you had the Indian Postal Service which back in the 1970s, early 1980s, mid 80s, up to, up to the beginning of neoliberalization used to deliver mail at least twice a day. At least twice a day. You know, you think to yourself, by the way, about what's happening in the US. And the US Postal Service now, I mean, it's 99% of what you get is all junk. It's, you know, flyers from Rouse and Vaughn's and, you know, uh, and then, you know, refinancing your student loan. I haven't had a student loan for 40 years. I still get two, two you know, things every day, right? Right? Offers from credit card companies, you know, ju junk bill. That's all it is. No, because no one actually writes letters anymore, at least as far as I know. Uh, I don't think my children who are, you know, my daughter is over 20. I don't think she's ever licked a post-it stamp and actually put it on an envelope. I mean, they don't even know what it means to do that, strangely enough. So what happened? This class of people, they opted out of the state postal service and they started using private couriers. Everything was courier delivery. They opted out of MTNL and they started using, when new liberalization came in, then you had these private companies that came in and started offering 
you know, Airtel, for example, is one of the big companies. We can also find it in some countries in Africa, by the way. This is an Indian company that's gone quasi-global, right? You can see it in Ethiopia and Kenya and places like that, right? They, they stopped sending the children to, to state schools, only private schools. They never used the public transportation system because all of them started taking out loans to buy cars, so forth and so on. Right, so it's a two-way process where the state is saying, hey, to hell with the poor. This is not, what the state is doing in these parts of the world is not a war on poverty. It's a war on the poor, which is a very different thing. You let, let them fend for themselves, you know? It's kind of a Malthusian world in which this state was and is really invested, all right? And one of the consequences of that has been this evisceration of the commons. This evisceration, the wiping out of the idea of both this notion of social goods in common, which is why you have enormous tax evasion, enormous tax evasion. You know, I was reading this here, okay, which of course, I, you know, you don't want to hear what I think of the chairman of Amazon and what I would do with him if I caught him, okay? Uh, I mean, in India, do you know what percentage of the population pays individual income tax? Two and a half percent. Two and a half percent, that's it. I mean, the tax evasion is enormous because again, this is a class of people who have absolutely no sense of ethical responsibility to the commons. Right? And this is what I mean. So we're talking about the state opting out, except, of course, there is a way in which the state has not opted out of the middle class. That is, the state actually subsidizes the middle class in some ways. For example, the state subsidizes it by creating special economic zones, SEZs, which are tax havens for people who come in and bring in investments, right? This was first pioneered in China, not in India. The special economic zones were pioneered in China. And they're, they're technically, they claim that these are special units, so you can actually speed up production. You don't have to worry about regulations. You don't have to worry about environmental regulations and laws to hold you back. Right? Well, what they really are, they're, they're tax havens for the super rich and for corporations who want to do business without actually having to adhere to any of the local labor laws, for example. In many of these special economic zones, which you have in countries such as China and India, the corporation that runs it is, is not only entitled to tax breaks, but they don't have to follow, for example, labor regulations very often. Right? They don't have to follow green regulations. Right? So you have a process of the state opting out except to offer further subsidies to the middle class. Secondly, you have a process of the middle class and the elites opting out of the state, turning to private resources in every sphere of life. And thirdly, what you have, which is partially a consequence of these two, but is a product of long-term social processes, is you have what I'm calling the evisceration of the idea of the commons or the idea of social goods shared, right? That is the fundamental picture that I think you have to bear in mind if you're looking at the story of what is called development in that part of the world. Now, in my next lecture, we're just gonna talk very briefly because rather than get, getting into data about, about you know, literacy, poverty, this and that, which I've done today, I'm gonna talk about ameliorative measures taken by the state. Because I don't want to suggest that the state has taken no measures. When you have a democracy, as you do in India, you need to take some ameliorative measures, right, in order to be able to obviously able to even claim that you are actually a democracy working for the poor. So we look at some of these ameliorative measures by the state in my next lecture.